good morning and welcome to People's Church. Would you see with us as we worship today? And who is thankful that we are people of heaven? Yes. Come on, get your hands up, hands up, people of heaven. Y'all, let's get those hands up. Sing it, hallelujah. Welcome to People's Church. So glad that you're here today. Psalm 1611 says that there is, in, there is fullness of joy in the presence of God. And today I pray that you will just experience that joy today. There's a lot of reasons for it because of the fact that not only are we going to worship God together, we baptized, I think, 23 people in the first gathering, and we're going to we're going to baptize a bunch more in this gathering. We're going to spend time together around the Word of God, continuing our series on the Holy Spirit, learning that Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, and so should we. And I just hope that you will enjoy your time. Maybe this is your first time 
maybe you've been here many, many, many times, but whatever else, that we would sense and know the fullness of joy that is in his presence today. Amen? Father, in Jesus' name, may your glory be known and your joy be felt in this place today. By the time we leave this place, may we look a little bit more like you, knowing each other and you a little bit better. Through your glory, I pray. And everyone said amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. I love this next song because this is our story. Maybe you're new in this room and maybe you don't even know who Jesus is, but this is the story of what he's done for us. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your bread and sang my own song. Yeah, come on. Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent. These shackles I wear, yes, I've all it on my own. Yeah, yeah. Come on, let's sing this together. The scarlet sins had a crimson cost You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled away Who's thankful that stone was rolled away? Come on!
gonna sing that chorus one more time. And I just want this to almost be a prayer from you to God, thanking Jesus for what he did on the cross. So if you're with me, sing this out. The scarlet sins had a crimson cost. He nailed my dead to that. Yeah, come on, lift it up, church. Scarlet sins, we sing scarlet sins, scarlet sins, had a crimson cross, he nailed my dead to that whole rugged cross, come on, in empty slay, at the empty grave, thank God, come on, scarlet sins, we sing scarlet, scarlet sins, had a crimson So Father, in Jesus' name, we give you glory. We can't even imagine right now the debt that we had, but what we do know is the sin that we were trapped in. Then Jesus came. It says in your word, God, that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It did not say he was joyful about the cross, but for what came beyond it the joy that was set before him because through the cross, he saw people saved. Through the cross, he saw bondage broken. Through the cross, he saw prodigals coming home. We thank you, God, that we are what Jesus saw on the other side of the cross. And now we get to walk in the glory and the majesty of the presence of the almighty God adopted as sons and daughters from slaves to children of God. So Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise in your name, all God's children said, amen. Come on, can we lift up one more moment of praise for him? Well, good morning, People's Church. You can go ahead and take your seats. If we have not met yet, my name is Erin. I am so excited to be here sharing the announcements with you on this Sunday. And I just wanna say thank you so much for taking time to come and spend your morning with us. We are so excited and grateful to have this time with all of you, but especially if you are a VIP. So if you have never been here before, or maybe you were here, but it was a really long time ago, you are a very important person and we have a room just for you. So at the end of the gathering, don't run on out. As you head out through the lobby on your left-hand side, you're gonna see our VIP room. I encourage you to head in there, meet our volunteers, get to know them and get your free present. We wanna bless you guys. Don't leave here without your free present. Now, wasn't last Sunday amazing? We had Go Sunday. We had Dick Brockton here, who is a missionary that we support, sharing about some of that he has learned, sharing an amazing and powerful message. And I am just so grateful that you got to meet just a few of the global outreach partners who we support worldwide. And yesterday, more locally, we did an I Love My City Serve Day at the Fresno Rescue Mission at their Rescue the Children campus. And we got to paint their chapel. We got to paint another room they had, organize a little store that they have. And I just wanna say to every single one of you who showed up and served, thank you because we could not have done it without you. And the Fresno Rescue Mission is doing such great work. What 
power a just simple coat of paint does to clear up and cheer up a room. We want all of the women and children who live there to feel so loved, to feel dignity, to feel honored. And so I am so grateful to all of you who came and gave your time just to paint, to organize, to give some love to the buildings that have been there for a while. And with that in mind, I just wanna share our newsletter. So this is our global and local outreach newsletter. You can sign up for it by using the QR code up on the screen. You can come talk to me in the lobby. Maybe you wanna just write newsletter on your connect card. That will all get back to me. And what this is, is simply a way to keep you up to date on everything that is happening with Go, with Global Outreach, which is missions, with I Love My City, which is our local outreach. We want you to be able to see when we pick up a new missionary, how you can pray for them. When we have an I Love My City event coming up, how you can get signed up to serve. We wanna keep you updated on all of the things that happen at our food pantry every week, the PC Care Center. Sometimes we see 150 families come through our care center in just one week. And we want you to know, we want you to be up to date and we want you to be able to pray and stay in touch. So if you are interested in signing up for this, do scan that code. Maybe you just wanna come talk to me. Maybe you wanna write it on that connect card. I would love to get you this newsletter. Last thing, we do have our engaged classes that are happening. So it is actually going on right now, but maybe you wanna go next week. You can go next week at 11 a.m. in the VIP room. You will have missed a few, but don't worry. You can always wait till the next round and get the few classes that you did miss. So if you ever wanna go to those, that's just a great way to get connected, get plugged in, find a way to serve, find a way to meet more people. We would love, love, love to see you there. And so the last thing that we're gonna talk about is our tithe and our offering. And we know here at People's Church that our tithe is simply just the first 10% of everything that we receive that actually belongs to God. And he calls us to give that to him obediently and faithfully. And our offering is anything above and beyond that. That can be just simply the generosity of your heart to give to an area that you are passionate about. So maybe that is global outreach, maybe it's missions, maybe it is pay it forward, maybe it's the care center, maybe it's benevolence, whatever that looks like for you, that is what we give above and beyond. And so before I pray, just wanna make you aware of the ways that you can give. You can use the QR codes on the back of your chairs, you can use the giving kiosks, the giving boxes with the envelopes. You can also use our app. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pray over all that is received today. Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to participate in everything that you are doing here in People's Church. Thank you for all of the multiplication that you will do through all of the money and the resources given today. I pray that it would go further than it would in our hands, that it would reach people, reach hearts, reach souls for you. I thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. We pray this in your name, amen. As Pastor Dale mentioned earlier, and if you're part of our faith family, you know when that screen goes up, that means baptisms are about to start. So can you stand with us as we celebrate baptisms? When you see them go in the water and out of the water, let them come up hearing rejoicing and excitement coming from this faith family. But let's do this, we're excited.
love about, about baptism, it's not just a public statement of people saying, I love Jesus. It's also a statement in the heavenlies to the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, saying, you once had me, but you have me no longer. It's a powerful statement. I love this, this these stories, and what. thank you for rejoicing with them. Before, we're, uh, before, before we go into our teaching, will you just take a moment and say hi to those around you before you're seated, and so we can... Uh, Greet one another and love on one another for a few moments. What's up, People's Church? Brad and Dick Brogdon did great in my absence, but I was gone. We, as you know, most of you know, I was in Israel with a group of, there's 41 of us in Israel, and I want to show you the picture just to prove I was there, and uh, it's not dated, but I can promise you that was taken just days ago as we were in Caesarea, one of our first stops actually on our trip. We had a great time. Thank you for as you prayed for us on this trip, it was great. We had no issues at all. Wonderful, wonderful time, as we always do. Welcome today. Great to see you. My name is Dale. I get to teach here most weeks. Welcome those that are watching online. Welcome. To, I know people in, our friends in Colorado watch us every week, and I, I hardly ever mention them, but Colorado, great to have you with us. Israel, I found out people in Israel are watching us on a weekly basis. Can you believe that? I gotta, I gotta brush up on my Hebrew, I guess. And all around the world and all across the country, we have people listening and watching and so glad that they're a part of our online family. Before we get into our teaching today, I need your help, and that is I want us to take a survey. In the midst of People's Church, over the summer and into the fall, we've been growing in numbers and adding new people, and because of that, and before, before uh, years ago, we had a third gathering before COVID hit, and, and so now we're considering moving to a third gathering again. We're seriously considering that, but we need your help in determining what that is through a survey. And so, Robert, would you come up here and help me, ex help me explain to them how they can help give us input and log into how we move forward, even as a church family, as far as our third gathering is concerned? All right. So... This survey will take about 90 seconds of your time, okay? 90 seconds, all right? There are three ways you can do it just in the gathering. There's a paper in the back of your seats, all right? So you've got that one there. You can fill it out. It's got the blue box on top of it. The blue is important, so hang on to that color for a minute. Um, also, if you're digital like me, you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you, and there's a thing on there that says, we want to hear from you, okay? Okay. So there's also a QR code up here if you happen to sit in a seat that does not have a QR code in front of it, okay? So the key here is we want to hear from you. We have digital surveys, we have paper surveys, and it takes about 90 seconds for you to fill it out. Now, when you're done with the survey, hang on to it through the gathering, and there will be blue buckets, blue box, blue buckets, at the end of the gathering for you to put, put it in, and then we will tally those. Thank you so much, right. because we not only want to hear from them, we need to hear from them, we so need. you can have an input on when that third gathering would be, as well as some other demographic questions there. Again, it's all anonymous, but we, we can you really use your help. We got great response first hour, and I'd imagine this hour is going to even have better response, don't you think? Yikes. Well, I, I guess all my friends are first hour, so... Anyway, so uh, please help us out with this survey, and then we can move forward making decisions that are educated and have some of your input behind it. All right. We are in this series called With You in Spirit, Teaching on the Holy Spirit. She started a number of weeks ago. And as I've been thinking and meditating on this, the idea that we either are people that spread the Spirit or we spread the flesh. 
which would you be? Which category would you be in? Do you spread the Spirit wherever you go and the Holy Spirit of God wherever you go, or do you spread more of who you are? If you have a, in, in, in consumer terminology, you have a supplier, you have a middleman, and you have the consumer or the receiver. And when you buy a candy bar or you buy something at a store, you're not getting that from the supplier. You're getting that through the middleman, whether that be a convenience store, a grocery store, a gas station, and the like. In the same way, we become the middlemen as people of God, as followers of Jesus. We become the middleman to distribute the Holy Spirit in our world today. And that spirit brings life and hope and joy and peace to people. Is that what you're bringing to people around you, whether it's in your neighborhood, in your own home, in your workplace, to your family? Do you, are, do you spread the flesh or do you spread the Holy Spirit? And I know that even in our lives, there at times we go through things in life. The loss or grief can get overwhelming. The burdens get, get really heavy. The frustrations can come in when we know we're supposed to live one way and we make decisions that are counter to that very way that we know God intended. The very things that we want to do, we don't want to do. And what is, you know, what can we do that in and of ourselves, it doesn't seem to be, we don't have that capability to live the way we're supposed to live, resist temptation when it comes our way. So hopefully we've come to the place in this life where we know that that deficiency can be met in the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I know that there can be different responses to this. There can be those that maybe you have just, you're new to church, you're new to uh, a journey with Jesus, and you're just open to whatever God would have for you, whatever that may be, and you put a lot of trust in us to to give you information and spiritual guidance and teachings from the Word of God and truth that would kind of help you along the way. There are others who have a background in church, and when it comes to the Holy Spirit, there, you kind of want to shy away or back away because you had a negative experience of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's from how it was preached or how it was portrayed or how it was practiced and there was a lot of things going on, and you weren't sure, and you, it wasn't explained, and things, and it got abused. And because of that, you want to kind of back away and not even talk about the Holy Spirit at all. And I understand that. And so, you know, I mean, some, some of you, some of us in our faith family have extreme, extreme stories about abuses of the Holy Spirit, even to the extreme of, I don't know if you know this, but there are churches that, you know, believe in snake handling, you know, that the snakes won't harm them because of the fact that God's going to protect them. I just want to assure you that we don't have that as part of our agenda today or ever. And so if you have snakes, just keep them in your bag, all right? Or maybe you're like me. I grew up in a Pentecostal charismatic home. My parents were not pastors, but we went to church every week, multiple times a week. And we went to a church that believed in the act of an up-to-date gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation. We believed in people being supernaturally healed, supernaturally delivered, supernaturally empowered at all times. And so when I was growing up, I became very at ease and familiar with the activity of the Holy Spirit in a gathering, whether that would be a person speaking in tongues or praying in tongues, uh, words of prophecy, the demonstrations of the Holy Spirit in different ways, including even passionate worship that would take place. Whatever your experience is, I want to have you open your heart and your life and your spirit to what we're teaching today because I think you'll find that it is very informed. And all the, the other thing I want to say is this, that whether you like it or not, believe it or not, Jesus was and is a Pentecostal. Jesus was and is charismatic. We normally here at People's Church, you, those of you who have been around more than, you know, three Sundays, you know that every Sunday I take a passage of Scripture and we break that down, we talk about it, and we teach it. That's not going to be the format of today's message, but I am going to overwhelm you with Scripture, all right? It's just not going to be in one passage. I'm going to read passages of Scripture, but there's not going to be one text per se. But there is a big idea in preparing a message uh, I tend to use the big idea approach, meaning I study a passage, I get a big idea, and then I form that big idea 
the main thought, if you will, sermon in a sentence, if you will, and then I shape everything around in my message around that. So I, and I don't normally, at times I will give you the big idea of a message, uh, but today I'm not only going to give it to you, we're going to repeat it over and over and over again so that you don't lose the big idea so that when you walk out of here, if nothing else, you'll say, I know exactly what Dale talked about today. And here's the big idea that I want to convey today is this. That Jesus, when he was on this earth, he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. How much more should we? So let's say this big idea together, and then throughout the message, I will be saying this over and over again. Here it is. Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. How much more should we? Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. He needed the Holy Spirit. He was dependent upon the Holy Spirit then don't you think if he was dependent upon the Holy Spirit, we too should be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Luke goes to great lengths to get this message across. Every gospel is different. The gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the first four books of the New Testament, about two-thirds of the way through your Bible, maybe three-quarters of the way through your Bible. He goes to great lengths. All the gospels are, are they're, they're chronicling the life, times, and ministry of Jesus Christ. And they all show it from a different perspective. It's like a, the facets of a diamond. They come from different angles. But Luke and his emphasis is always showing us that Jesus walked and lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, he was God, so he had the Holy Spirit. Yes, but there is a part of, in, in when we look at Jesus, we have to understand that what Jesus did when he was born of a virgin, what he did was he emptied himself of all access to his God power and his Godness. So he limited himself. He was always God, but he limited his access to God and his power so that he could grow up like you and I grew, grow up and live and develop in life. In, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, it says that he, in the NIV, it says he made himself nothing. Other versions say he emptied himself. In theological circus, we call this the kenosis passage, which comes from that Greek word, emptied, or he made himself nothing. Meaning, he limited his access to all the God powers that he had available to him so that he would walk and live in our experience. So therefore, when he's in school and he's learning and the teacher asks a question, Jesus isn't saying, well, I know the answer to this because I know everything. He wasn't in his crib thinking about physics or, ma or complicated mathematical questions because of the fact that that's not, he grew up as a child. So he thought baby thoughts when he was a baby, and he thought godly junior high thoughts, middle school thoughts when he was in middle school. I know you didn't think that's possible, but he did. Can a middle schooler think anything godly? Yes, they can. Luke chapter 2, verse 52 says that about Jesus, that he grew in his stature, in his physical body, and he grew in wisdom and in stature. Well, if he's God, how does God grow in wisdom? Well, because he limited himself to all the wisdom of the world, he grew in wisdom like you and I can grow in wisdom. In Matthew chapter 24, it says that Jesus is telling about the end times, and he says, only the Father in heaven knows the day and time of my return. He's essentially saying, I don't even know when I'm going to return because the Father will instruct me when I do that. So even as part of the Godhead, he has limited his power and his access to all of his God power, all of his God access while he's on this, on this earth. That doesn't mean he is any less God. He limited himself so that he could walk this worth like you and I. So here's the big question. Here's the big question. He is limiting his access to all of his God power and all of his Godness as the part of, as, a, as 
part of the Godhead, he limits himself. So how does he resist sin? How does he overcome the devil? How does he do miracles? How does he have a close, intimate relationship with his heavenly father? How is it that he can preach and say exactly what needs to be said at the right moment it needs to be said? How does he see through people's hearts? How does he know what people are thinking? Luke will go to great extents to say this. He does it because he has the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the good news. You have access to that same Holy Spirit. The big idea is Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. How much more should you and me? And Luke wrote his gospel. So Luke not only wrote the book of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. The New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts. It would be easier to put this together if I think Luke and Acts were right next to each other. Interestingly enough, they're, all, they're both about the same length. If you want a little bit of meaningless information, most scrolls at that time were 35. The longest of scrolls in the first century were 35 feet long. And both Luke and Acts are scrolls about 35 feet long. That's what he wrote on. Luke was very deliberate in how he depicted not only Jesus, but the early church. He wrote both books. And what I want to show you today is something very specific, and that is this. Because we at times just focus on Jesus' death when his life is very important to us. We need to know, yes, by his death we live, but by his life we learn how to live. Even the Apostles' Creed says that the, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and rose again on the third day. It goes right from his birth to his death, and his death is important, but there's something in between of how he lived that we can glean from that will help give us hope and life and joy in this life. Amen? So that's what we're going to talk about, even his life. So Luke, this is, this is very, again, this is a very different format of a message, but I'm, I'll keep you, I'll, I'll try to keep you with me. What we're going to talk about is we're going to look at the book of Luke and the book of Acts. The book of Luke chronicles how Jesus operated in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then Luke draws these parallels then to the book of Acts and how the church experienced and utilized the power of the Holy Spirit. So Luke shows Jesus with the Holy Spirit. Acts, written by Luke, shows the church in the power of the Holy Spirit. There are these parallels that we're going to draw so that we can learn and be encouraged and go from that. All right? That's what, so that's where we're going today. You all right with that? All right, so let's just begin at his birth. Jesus' birth and the birth of the church. Let's just look at this quick parallel. You have Jesus' birth, which is recorded in Luke chapter 1, where the Bible says that the, the Holy Spirit overshadowed. He That the angel of the Lord came to Mary and says, the Holy Spirit will be with you and the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit is going to be with you. That what was conceived in Mary was conceived of the Holy Spirit. That's how Jesus was born. And then even when Jesus began his ministry, when he, right before he began his ministry, he was baptized. And at his baptism, there's not only a voice from heaven, but there was a, that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the bodily form of a, of a dove. And then you have the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. The birth of Jesus was Holy Spirit, was Holy Spirit directed. And in Acts chapter 2, we have the, 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 the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 where the Holy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit descended on those that were believers and the church was born is incredible. Then Jesus' first sermon and the church's first sermon. The Jesus' first sermon was in the town of Nazareth. This is Luke chapter 4 again. And what happened was is he opened the scroll and he read from Isaiah. And this is what he said. The spirit of the Lord is on me. The spirit of the Lord is on me are his words. And he has anointed me. And he talked about being anointed to bring deliverance and bring freedom to those that are captive. 
That's what he talked about. And then you have Acts chapter 2. The church's first sermon is Peter preaching about the Holy Spirit coming and now being manifest in the church's life on a daily basis. Immediately after Jesus was baptized, the Bible says in Luke chapter 4 verse 1 that he goes out to the wilderness and he has four, he's 40 days tempted in the wilderness. Luke says something about this that no other gospel mentions, and that is this, that Jesus is, number one, full of the Holy Spirit, and, listen, he is led by the Holy Spirit, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, he's led by the Holy Spirit to go into the wilderness to be tempted. The Holy Spirit is the one leading him to do that. Now you have the book of Acts and the church and the Holy Spirit, and you have the disciples that now are thrust into the world after they are baptized. Now they are thrust in front of the Sanhedrin, another test. And the Bible said that the Holy Spirit came upon them, them and empowered them in that moment. In Luke, it says Jesus was sent out by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the kingdom of God. In the book of Acts, we know that the Holy Spirit comes on us so that we will go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. We too are sent out. And so Luke continues to draw these parallels between the experience of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the experience of the church and the Holy Spirit. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Because Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. How much more should we? How much more should we? Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. How much more should we? So let me give you four examples of these parallels, all right? The first is with miracles, the miracles that were done. We see in Luke, he says of Jesus in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, watch, look at this, and the power of the Lord was present with Jesus to heal the sick. The power of the Lord was present with Jesus to heal the sick. Will you say the power of the Lord? Yes, because he's Jesus and he's God. No, what Luke is saying here is he's specifically talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 5 is he's talking specifically about the paralytic that was brought to Jesus in the town of Capernaum. We know it's Capernaum because Mark chapter 2 gives us the exact location of this miracle where the the room, the house where he was teaching was jammed full of people. And so these guys wanted to bring Jesus, this paralytic that needed to be healed. So they tore their roof open and they dropped this guy down. And that's when it said of Jesus, the, there was the power of the Lord was upon Jesus to heal the sick. Incredible. And in fact, it was fun because just days ago when we had our group to Israel, we went to Capernaum. And it was just, it was just awe-inspiring to think of where would where did that take place. Again, it's only a place of about, I think 12, is it 12 acres big? And yet you could go, I wonder which house that was at where he, where he healed that paralytic, where the power of the Lord was on Jesus to heal the sick. Then you have in the book of Acts, now the Spirit comes on the apostles and they do incredible miracles. They speak in tongues uh, a language that they have never heard before. Stephen gets to see into the heavenlies by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see a, a, a miracle that took place in Acts chapter 13. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Are you still with me? Say, I'm with you. I'm moving fast, aren't I? I'm not going to slow down. All right, here we go. Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are on this island called Cyprus, which is still there today. It's just west of the uh, nation of Israel in the Mediterranean Sea, the island of Cyprus, that they're there. This is Acts chapter 13, starting at verse 4. If you're with me, say, I'm with you. If you're there, say, I'm there. The two of them, Paul and Barnabas, sent on their way, were sent on their way by what? Say it louder. The Holy Spirit. They went down to, to Seleucia and they sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, uh, yeah, Salamis, they, uh, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Verse 6. 
they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. This is encouraging, isn't it? But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, was what? Now there's a, there's a descriptor of him, and it says what? Say it louder. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. So what's about to take place is by the direction of the Holy Spirit. He looked straight at him and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Verse 11, look at it. Now the hand of the Lord, he said to this man, is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Kind of a reverse miracle, don't you think? Instead of speaking away the blindness, he speaks blindness on him because of his opposition to the gospel and his resistance to even the proconsul coming to know Jesus. And so because of this, he's going to teach him it's not going to be a permanent blindness, but it's going to be a blindness for a time. And don't try this at home, friends, with, your, you know, with people you're just having a hard time with, all right? This is not what the, unless the Holy Spirit's on you to do this. But isn't it interesting that this would happen? Philip is baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch in, in Acts chapter 8, and he's, uh, Luke, Acts chapter 8, and he's baptizing him. And the Bible says that as soon as they, he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, the Holy Spirit transported him across the desert. Wow! This is what's happening. And you're going, what, what, what? Healings like this, blindness striking, people teleporting. I bet you you're going to bring out the snakes. No, we're not going to bring out the snakes. Keep them in your bag. Let's talk about prophecy. Not only miracles, but prophecy. And that is speaking out God's agenda, speaking out God's heart. Speaking out that which is going to happen in the future. It happens with Elizabeth speaking out blessings on Mary. Remember, Simeon is in the temple courts. He's an old man, and he was promised. He was pro it was prophesied to him, you will not die until you see the Lord's Messiah. And God met that prophecy. In Acts, you see... That was in Luke. In Acts, you see prophecy taking place all over. It, uh, the one that fascinated me as I was looking at this is in two places in Acts, there's this guy named Agabus. We don't know really anything about this guy, Agabus, but he shows up on the scene led by the Holy Spirit and he prophesies. The first is in Acts chapter 11 when he says to the church, he prophesies of a famine that's going to be coming, which, which archaeologists, by the way, have confirmed that this actually took place. He prophesied of a famine so that the early church could prepare and minister during this famine. The second one was in, in Acts chapter 21 when Agabus prophesies to the apostle Paul, and he ties himself up with Paul's uh, garments and, and his belt, he ties himself up to illustrate what's going to happen to Paul as he goes to Jerusalem. Not to tell him not to go, but to say, I want to warn you, this is what's going to come your way. And Paul still went, and trial came his way. But Agabus, sent by the Holy Spirit to prophesy and give words to tell of what is happening. So not only miracles and prophecy, but then you have preaching. When you have preaching, Preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, before I get into this point, i got to ask you a question. Am I the only preacher in this room? Are you sure? Do you have to have the title preacher to be a preacher? Because a preacher is one who declares the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how many preachers do I have in the room? Yes, I'm preaching to a room full of preachers. Then that was, if, if the preaching was left to the leadership, then the early church never would have succeeded. 
but because everyone is called to preach and proclaim and declare the good news of Jesus Christ. You may have an audience, a congregation, if you will, of two people or one person or eight people or whatever, but you're still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, in, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 4, it says that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he, what did he do in light of that? He preached and he proclaimed the kingdom of God. And the same language is used about the church in the book of Acts chapter 2 when 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says this. After they prayed, the disciples prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled, what? With the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Look at Luke chapter 12. It says this. When they bring you before the synagogues, rulers, and the authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. I'm not sure what I'm going to say. I'm not sure how I'll defend myself. These are intimidating people. What am I going to say? Do not worry about how you'll defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time exactly what you should say. Because Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? How much more should we? We have got to have the Holy Spirit in the same way Jesus did. Lastly, not only, not only miracles, not only prophecy, not only preaching, but the last that you, comes out as we look at Acts and Luke is this idea of joy. Joy being attached to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 10 verse 21 says this, At that time Jesus, at that time Jesus Full of joy. How did he get his joy? How did he get his joy, church? Through the Holy Spirit. Joy is not happiness. Happiness has to do with your circumstances. The circumstances are great. I'm happy. But joy is, no matter what the circumstances are, you still have a calm and a sense God is in control. I'm going to be all right. Paul in a Philippian jail is singing, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. In the worst of conditions, he's saying, I have the joy of the Lord. Now, have you ever, re have you ever rejoiced in the Holy Spirit? Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 52. It says, and the disciples, this is now Acts, not Luke, but Acts. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with joy and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Friends, I'm telling you this. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are also going to have joy as a part of your life. The reason I know some of you are not filled with the Holy Spirit is because I can see it on your face. Right? Some of you just need to kind of, I don't know. You need to get the Holy Ghost is what you need to get. You need a little joy in your life. Because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be filled with joy. And a church that has the Holy Spirit is going to be characterized by joy. Are things going perfect in our lives? No, but we have the joy of the Lord and that joy gives us strength. It's going to be characterized by joy. Look what Psalm 35 verse 27 says. May those who delight in salvation shout for joy. <laughs> Not bad. I didn't even have to tell you to do it. Because it's a command, right? May those... Do you delight in the joy of the salvation? Do you, do, do you delight in the joy of salvation? Then let's shout for joy. Yes. Yes. Galatians 5 says, be filled with the Spirit and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Psalm 1611, quoted at the very beginning of this gathering, that in his presence is fullness of joy. 
Our gatherings should have exuberant joy and celebration because it's who we are worshiping. Yes, it should be characterized by that. Yes, and some of you need to get a hold of this. Well, it's not my personality. Joy is not a personality, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And you need to get that gift. I just have a sneaking suspicion that that, that stoic look of yours would change if someone notified you that you just won $200 million in the lottery. I have a feeling at least, you know, after years of stoi being stoic, the smile would come across your face. Right? something would start to happen that you go, hmm, life isn't so bad after all. And if that would happen to you and you're not joyful in a room like this, maybe, you're, maybe you delight more in the lottery than you do in the presence of Jesus. Where is your delight? Those who delight in his salvation shout for joy. In both Luke and Acts, the gift of the Holy Spirit is always given upon request. All you have to do is ask. Look at Luke chapter 11. It says this. Go to the first slide. There you go. Which of you fathers, mothers, parents, if your child's son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Here, you want some Chick-fil-A? No, here's a tarantula. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you, then, though you are evil, that's us, we're evil, our hearts. If you, even though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more Will your Father in heaven give you what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. How much more? So we go to Israel. Now, uh, so we go to Israel. And before I leave for Israel, Joni, who never asks for anything. She just doesn't ask for anything. And by the way, I didn't tell her... She heard this first hour, but she didn't know prior to this, and I'll explain why that matters in just a second. So she said to me, Dale, you know, while you're in Israel, and so when she starts to say what she wants, I'm thinking, this is awesome, right? She said, you know what I would kind of like, and I want to know. I want to know what she wants, right? Even though I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a perfect husband. You may not know that. She knows that. So... I'm not a perfect husband. I, I, you know, I have an evil heart just like all of you. A dark heart. I'm just a sinful heart. That's, and yet she says, I know what I want. I, th I, I think I know what I'd like. And she said, I would like a necklace that has my name in Hebrew on it. You know, my name in Hebrew on a necklace. This is, this is awesome. So I bought her lotion. I mean, the Dead Sea lotion, it has that, those healing salts in it. Just And by the way, I did get her lotion. But I also, also bought her a necklace with her name in Hebrew on it. She didn't know, and she, if she would have known, she would have worn that necklace today to prove that I actually did. She said, this is what I want. I was overjoyed to be able to give that to her. The Heavenly Father, when you say, could I please have another portion of the Holy Spirit? He's not going to give you something else. He is more than thrilled when we say, Will you give me the Holy Spirit? And he said, I will gladly give you the Holy Spirit. 
We who have evil hearts, wrong hearts, dark hearts, when someone says that we love to give it, how much more the Heavenly Father will give? Because Jesus walked in the Holy Spirit, and he will give it to us if we ask, how much more should we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? He did miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. He overcame sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. He resisted He resisted temptation because of the power of the Holy Spirit. He did miraculous things and said things at the right time because of the power of the Holy Spirit. How much more? The, Jesus overcame the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. The apostles in the New Testament church overcame the world because because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you and I can overcome because of the power of the Holy Spirit. I love how Zechariah, how he so succinctly says it in Zechariah chapter 4, 6, when he says, and you know this verse, it's not by might, it's not by power, but what? By my spirit, says the Lord. So what do you depend on for victory? How do you overcome? What is even your source of joy and happiness in this life? Because most of us, in my estimation, depend upon the wrong source for the power that we so desperately need to make it in this life. To overcome overwhelming loss and grief to handle the heavy burdens of life. To handle the frustration of just wanting to be a certain way and you're not that way. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. He needed the power of the Holy Spirit. He walked in that power. How much more, if Jesus needed it, how much more do we need it? Because we, a lot of times, allow fear to dictate rather than the Holy Spirit. We allow things that we read and information we take in rather than the Holy Spirit for our lives. We know that maybe if the Holy Spirit takes over, we're going to start to have to look at things differently and even look at our money differently, look at our family differently, look at our lives differently. Maybe that's why you shy away from the Holy Spirit, but I'm telling you this, the Holy Spirit's going to bring you joy, peace, and life, power, and authority. We need the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus did. So question, two questions actually. Number one, do you have the same access to the Holy Spirit that I have? Say it like you mean it. Yes. yes. All right. Bigger question. Do you have the same access to the Holy Spirit that Jesus had? Yes, you do. And when we ask for it, our Heavenly Father would give it to us. The enemy of your soul, Satan himself, wants to separate you from the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and the joy of the Holy Spirit in your life. He does. Because if he, if he can't keep you out of heaven, at least, at least he can make you powerless on the way there. But I'm saying... Why not not only have heaven, but have the nuclear power of the Holy Spirit accessed every single day of my life? You can have the power of the Holy Spirit. We can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit just like Jesus did. All we have to do is say, Lord, I need the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you how I remind myself of this. I remind myself of my need for the Holy Spirit when I get into a situation, when I get into a time, it gets overwhelming, I take a deep breath. The reason I do that is because the Hebrew word for spirit is ruah. And it's the same word for breath, wind, breath, Holy Spirit. It's all the same word. So when I take a deep breath, I'm reminding myself. It's not something magical. It's just a reminder for me to say, depend on the Holy Spirit. Depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. I just take a deep breath in. And I don't know if you know this, but you're taking breaths all the time. 
And just as you need the air that you breathe, you need the power of the Holy Spirit residing within you. Let's stand together. As we stand, pastors, counsel, will you come to the front of the room? Nothing is better than you. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Before I pray a prayer blessing on you, I have a few instructions. First is this, I wanna pray for those that, that wanna make a decision to follow Jesus today. The Bible says that you can't even have this desire to know Jesus without the Holy Spirit leading you there. And some of you, the Holy Spirit's right there. You wouldn't categorize it or say it in that language, but it's really true. You just, the Holy Spirit's just drawing you to Jesus right now. It's not to a church, but to Jesus. And right now, you just need to respond to that. And I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe God right now that many of you are just, just right now responding to the Holy Spirit, those watching online and right here in this room. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for those that are just responding to you right now, that have this desire to just follow you, to become a child of God, to throw aside and repent and walk away from everything that they've been trying to find life in. And now it's you, to find joy in you, to find life and hope and peace in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, as they just say, Lord Jesus, I turn away from everything else to find life and satisfaction in you. I find forgiveness in you. I find joy in you. And in this moment, they become a child of God. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord Jesus. And then two other things before I pray a prayer blessing. Number one, if you, if you want, there's people at the front of this room that would love to pray with you. Maybe it's about the Holy Spirit's presence and power in your life. Maybe it's about a miraculous healing that you need or a miracle applied to a situation in your life somehow, these people would love to pray with you as people have already started to come forward. Please don't miss a miracle that's up here. And secondly, if you need instructions on what to do next in your walk with Jesus, we have a QR code right here that you can put your phone on and tap on that and get information. You can also get that in the VIP room as you leave. Will you just allow me to pray a prayer blessing over you? Get in a posture where I can pray a prayer blessing over you. I love this moment in our gathering. Father, in Jesus' name, as we are just recipients of your blessing, I thank you right now that you pour out those blessings on us in Jesus' name. We don't deserve them. We haven't earned them. But, Father, we receive them with gladness and joy. And, Father, I pray that we would sense the glory and the love of your face to shine upon us that you would be gracious to us and you'd give us peace, that we would walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that every now and again this week, our breath is going to remind us of our need for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord Jesus, we depend upon the Holy Spirit just like you did. And, Father, may the very hands that are reaching out for blessing and receiving blessing today be the very hands that will be the source of a miracle, that will be the source of a prayer answered, that will be the source of life and hope and peace given to people. I pray that there would be peace and harmony in our families, that there would be, we would be dispensers of, of hope and life through the Holy Spirit, that we would be people of joy and exuberance, not because everything is going well and perfectly, but, Lord, because we have you and we delight in your salvation. And, Father, I speak that we'd be leaders and not followers, the head and not the tail. That, Father, I pray that when we believe that you are, you are leading us to a job through an interview, Lord, you'd give us that job in Jesus' name. Lead us by the Holy Spirit to the right places and to the right people. 
And Father, I pray that you give us great health, great friends, and God's very, very best. It's for your glory and reputation, I pray. And everyone said amen. amen. Love you guys. God bless you as you come to pray or you go loving each other. God bless you. Love you. See you next